Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMagan. <laughs> we are coming at you live from Mises University 2024 here at our campus in Auburn, Alabama, here at the Mises Institute. So there is actually a live audience. And uh, I'm here. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor at the Mises Institute. And here is my co-host, Tho Bishop. Also, and uh, there's a video version of this. If you're listening to this on Spotify, you could actually watch this event as well on YouTube. That's uh, YouTube slash Mises Media if you want to see the video. Um, also, I would recommend going to our channel to see all of the lectures from this week's Mises University and all sorts of content. If you're not familiar with that, I know that we have a lot of listeners who've never actually visited Mises.org. You should really do that. And anything that we're talking about, usually uh, it's going to be articles that also can be found at the Mises Institute's website, which is M-I-S-E-S -E dot O-R-G. Well, so this is the episode where we answer viewer mail. Yes. We haven't, we haven't done this before. And... Uh, so fortunately, people actually wrote in. We did not make up these questions. I can assure you. There's integrity in the process. <laughs> Although, what I did notice is that they all came in and they all had a similar theme. They were all related to uh, issues of strategy and uh, what should we do in terms of uh, fighting the forces of despotism, that sort of thing. And so that got me thinking about, well, how should we really just sort of kick off the episode then? I wanted to provide some sort of, you know, content on which to just get the ball rolling. And uh, I stumbled upon an essay. It's a short essay that I thought would help really frame the situation a little bit. It's an essay called The Meaning of Revolution. And this is by Murray Rothbard from 1969. It's in this great old book, Egalitarianism is a Revolt Against Nature. If you haven't seen it, you should get one. I used to read this all the time when I was an undergraduate. I used it in my master's thesis. There's all sorts of great essays in it. It has Anatomy of the State is in here, which is one of our most popular essays uh, by Rothbard. It's also got his essay on war and peace and stuff on primitivism and equality and all that sort of stuff. So... Uh, lots of great long essays, but this one's only like 900 words. Uh, and he's talking here about uh, the issue of what does it mean to participate in a revolution. And he provides a few interesting comments in here that I thought would just uh, uh, help us uh, conceptually with answering some of these questions uh, from listeners. And he, he just starts off talking about how people have a misconception about what a revolution is, that how people think that, well, okay, if you're participating in a revolution, then, there's, uh, then people must be, like, firing guns or they're storming buildings and things like that. And I guess I'll just go straight to the, the quotation. Uh, Rothbard says, most people, when they hear the word revolution, think immediately and only of direct acts of physical confrontation with the state, raising barricades in the streets, battling a cop, storming the Bastille or over other government buildings. But this is only one small part of revolution. Revolution is a mighty, complex, long-run process, a complicated movement with many vital parts and functions it is the pamphleteer writing in his study. It is the journalist, the political club, the agitator, the organizer, the campus activist, the theoretician, the philanthropist. It is all this and much more. Each person and group has its parts to play in this great complex movement. And that's often a point I have to make to people who... Uh, come to me and they're upset often that the Mises Institute isn't doing everything. They want this. It's not good enough for them that the Mises Institute is playing the part of about two-thirds of these roles that Rothbard points here. We should also be organizing, I guess, a private army to storm the streets and things like that. And I, I have no, nothing against all of these other parts involved in revolution, but that's not what the Mises Institute does. Uh, we have our own role that we play, but we will talk, I think, a little bit about uh, all the different parts that go into this. And I know that uh, we just concluded a panel talking about some of this um, 
Yeah, but of course, our, our listeners out in the broader world who haven't been listening to the previous uh, event here at Mises, you uh, didn't hear that. Uh, but really, there was just a broader discussion about, okay, what should I do with my life and just uh, all day long if I'm really, really concerned about these issues? And I think in this essay, Rothbard talks about the many, many different parts of it and also provides some important historical perspective. There's more I can say about this essay here uh, going forward, but what, what was your reaction to this, though? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting... Um, it, it had been quite a, some time since I'd last read that, and it actually sparked an interest. Um, Libertarian Forum is very fascinating. It, it, it was one of the, the newsletters of the movement. You can kind of really see uh, you know, the, the, the origin story of the libertarian movement. You can kind of really find it within that. Um, the, same, the, the same article was published alongside a Carl Hess article. And a, a big focus of it is kind of this very interesting aspect of kind of the division of labor within an intellectual movement. Um, which is important as everything um, else, and it's it's interesting because you know we, we, this is you know written in 1969. Um, you know, even though we do not live in in Kapistan, we have not had sort of a, the, the grand libertarian revolution at the gates. Um, seeing everything that has been built up with it for the cause of libertarianism is 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 really interesting. I mean, you know, go, going from the time where you know. Every libertarian could fit in Murray Rothbard's, you know, living room to, you know, the amount of people that we can get out to spend a, a week talking about Austrian economics and libertarianism here in, in Auburn, Alabama. Um, but really this, this international element to it where we've got within our crowd here, um, you know, people from all around the world motivated, motivated by these ideas that have their own networks and things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's really an incredible thing. And, and I think ultimately what it comes down to is strategy, ideas, things like that, they, they cannot simply be words on paper, right? That it's, it requires flesh and blood individuals, it requires networks, it requires talents, it requires skills, right? It's not, the ideas themselves are not enough. It's people that are willing to, you know, the ability to connect with others and to find out, you know, what advantages do you have individually? What, what, what is the role that you can play um, for whatever the outcome is? And, um, I think you know, Rothbard alone, single-handedly, I think, filled about half of the uh, the roles listed uh, in, in that article. Uh, right. I, I, every time I, I hear about Rothbard's activities, I think about how exhausting that sounds because it talks about how to stay up till 3 a.m. talking with the students in the coffee shops and socializing for hours and hours. Well, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So it's, uh, you know, I'm just not suited for that aspect of uh, the work. Uh, but I think that one, one aspect that uh, Rothbard was always very good about was bringing a lot of historical context to the topic. And I think a lot of people, uh, they have really so little to work with if they don't have knowledge about how these movements work and how revolutions happen and having a number of historical examples over time. Uh, in fact, for most Americans I encounter, they really don't know much of anything beyond, say, the American Revolution, a couple things about the 19th century, and that's all they have to work with in terms of what should my activism be. And so unless you can imagine guys in like three-cornered hats doing it or writing constitutions and things like that, there's just, there's very little variety in the strategy and tactics that get engaged. And uh, Rothbard, of course, we took it all way beyond that. Uh, he continues in this essay, let us take, for example, the major model for libertarians of our time, the great classical liberal, or better, classical radical revolutionary movement of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. So he's going back to the 17th century, that's 1600s, and uh, he's taking it back as you would really have to at least go back to the English Civil Wars, right? We're talking Locke, we're talking Cromwell, we're talking the Levelers, who Rothbard would consider to be really the first um, significant uh, and identifiable, identifiable, truly libertarian movement. He says, these, our ancestors, created a vast, sprawling, and brilliant revolutionary movement, not only in the United States, but also throughout the Western world, that lasted for several centuries. This was the movement largely responsible for radically changing history, for almost destroying history, as it was previously known to man. For before these centuries, the history of man, with one or two luminous exceptions, was a dark and gory record of tyranny and despotism. 
Uh, I mean, maybe that overstates it slightly. I mean, I think, there were, I think there was more than a couple bright spots in that history, but he is absolutely right that this, as I'll discuss in my talk here in about an hour, this idea of self-determination, of uh, being able to make a life for yourself separate from the regime, uh, where the, the regime did not have a right to rule over you uh, in any sort of true way, was, was pretty much a 17th, 18th, 19th century idea. And uh, we're still living with the benefits of that today, even though regimes are doing their best to unravel all of that. And uh, it's just one counter-revolution after another. But Rothbard, uh, he understood that uh, you need to have a, a far more broad appreciation beyond simply the Americans and a, uh, a few, a tiny handful of activists who we might point to and say, oh, those are the good guys. It's actually kind of demoralizing when uh, your whole... Uh, quiver of good guys is like two or three people and everybody else is absolutely awful. Uh, there are actually many, many people have contributed to this movement in a variety of different ways and I would definitely encourage people to become more familiar with those. And Rothbard goes into some of these uh, names here. I mean, do you encounter that too or am I just the only one who seems to have this problem where I talk to these people who have questions about activism and the history of the movement and they just don't seem to know very much about it at all, or is it just the people who talk to me about it? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think you get a lot of like the the reading the the the, the full. I mean, particularly connecting the libertarian, you know, the, the to previous you know, kind of classical liberal revolutions and things like that. We recognize the the length of that tradition. Um, I, I think there's definitely. Uh, it, it, so I'll start with Ron Paul, right? I think with the way that, mm. at least my generation, right? So it was that, that was the moment of, of political awakening. And a lot, I think a lot of people have not uh, yeah, come to appreciate it. And, and, and that's the thing, though, is that, you know, it's, it's one thing. It's not simply that the history exists, but there are um, uh, lessons and examples that you can take away from it. Again, like the, one of my favorite periods is the Jacksonian era and things like that. And it was a successful period of, of making money and banking, finance, politically potent factors that helps overturn, you know, the regime of the day. And so that's where there, there is value in going back and learning, you know, what were the circumstances with, with these his, uh, historical anecdotes um, that were able to have real outcomes. Um, and, and you, guys, you know, it, it can, you know, history, you know the, the whole aspect of, of history rhymes. Like these, there is wisdom that comes from understanding um, these these past episodes that have application to to the modern arena, and you know, particularly outside the U.S., it's it's interesting. Again, I, I think South America, for example, right now, right, you know, we, we have seen I think particular examples of you know whether it's less Marx, more Mises protests in Brazil, and the way that inflation played a, a major role in kind of uh, storing that. I know infl inflation is continuing to be a number one issue within Europe and things like that. So again, understand the history of how uh, anti-inflationary -infl movements um, sparked uh, <laughs> broader political change is uh, something that could continue with relevance uh, in, in the current world. Well, now would be a good time to note that uh, coming later this year, we'll have a new book coming out. Uh, I have fin just finished editing and uh, annotating um, Ralph Rako's 10-hour lecture series on the history of liberty. And uh, that's so that'll you know that'll be like a 300 page book on the history of liberty that'll be coming out where Ralph will walk you through uh, uh, libertarian political thought in the last really more than 400 years of it so if you need uh, to get all caught up that's a good book uh, you can read or you can also just listen to the lectures uh, as well but uh, this will this will be available to you as a scholar or academic to quote to use the footnotes and that sort of thing which aren't included in the original audio version, but uh, that's Ralph Rako's book. Rako, of course, was close friends with, with Rothbard, and I notice here that in the next paragraph, Rothbard names a lot of the same names that you would encounter in uh, this book coming from Rako. Uh, he goes on, the classical revolutionary movement was made up of many parts. It was the libertarian theorists and ideologists, the men who created and wove the strands of libertarian theory and principle, the la boetis, that is Etienne de la Boétie. Uh, you should read his book if you haven't. The levelers in 17th century England, the 18th century radicals, the philosophes, the physiocrats, the English radicals, the Patrick Henrys and Tom Paines of the American Revolution, the James Mill, not John Stuart Mill, uh, and Cobdens of 19th century 
uh, England, the Jacksonians and abolitionists and Thoreau's in America, the Bastiats and Molinari's in France. And so this is just a great paragraph right here. If you're, you're interested in people you should be reading, if you're interested in people who practically applied these theories and provided a framework for what to do, what to do with these ideas of liberty. And uh, also note, he mentions the abolitionists here and he's got some, uh, Rothbard's also got some great work on how the abolitionists are basically the model in terms of establishing a very radical end goal and then moving toward it bit by bit, never compromising, but also moving a small piece at a time toward that final goal. And I find that uh, a lot of people who I encounter in our movement, they don't, they don't understand how that works at all. Uh, there's, this, there's this desire to have immediate victory now, and anything that, I mean, the perfect example would be, gee, there's this bill up to slash the income tax by 90%. Should we support it? Well, it's not 100% slashing of the income tax, so therefore I am against it. Um, that's not how you win. What you do is you support the 90% income tax, and then two minutes after you get that 90% cut in the income tax, you say, oh, well, let's cut the income tax now 90 more percent until you get it to zero. That is, that's how the abolitionists worked with slavery. You limit it here, you limit it there. You, you chip away at it as much as you can until you really put a dent in the guys you're against, um, rather than just sitting back and waiting for the final total victory. Uh, so you can, you can see more here as well that Rothbard certainly understood uh, how that works as well. Um, I mean, I assume you encounter that also. I mean, you're always talking to completely different people from me, and you're just in a completely different world. I, I mean, you, you prob based on what you've said, you probably encounter a lot more pragmatic-minded people, but I find in those cases the problem is that a lot of those people are far more willing to go slightly in the wrong direction, thinking that, oh, well, if I, if I just give in on this, then I can gain that something better, which is different from being willing to not get everything you want at once. You, you know what I mean there, that distinction? Right, right. Um... <laughs> Then you also just get people that just like being angry for the sake of being angry. And so that therefore, the goal isn't, you know, any particular objective outside of just kind of yelling about things, which is, you know, happens a lot both in, in D.C. and local, uh, <laughs> local areas. Um, but, yeah, trying to identify ways of, of you know, and then and for, first and foremost, so it requires having a objective, like a true objective. That's why you know, Rothbard talked about, you know, do you really hate the state or not? There's plenty of people that are, are libertarians and kind of policy realms that they, they don't really hate the state. They just want to make sure that they have their little, you know, their little carve out, um, you know, talking about occasional tax reform or things like that. I mean, you need, you need to actually have a, a larger true objective guiding you. Obviously, that, if you don't have that, then, you know, what are you measuring by anyway? So. Well, I think uh, you should just read the essay uh, if... Uh, you haven't yet, and I think it provides a good uh, just overall impression of what Rothbard thought was important, what different roles within the revolutionary movement could be. And uh, just by coincidence, before I even started working on this, I just uh, published this week an article on Lenin and his uh, successful coup in uh, Russia in 1917, right? The point of this was, this was taken from some other work by historians noting that the uh, the October Revolution, quote-unquote, wasn't really a revolution. It was a coup. And this has been some uh, research that's come to light by historians in the last 50 years or so, uh, maybe longer, where what they discovered was that the left wanted to convince you that the reason the Bolsheviks were successful in 1917 Russia was because they had built up this huge mass movement and won over everybody with just the, the amazingness of their ideas. And everybody wanted to be a communist and everyone was so horribly oppressed that uh, they just embraced Lenin and his gang uh, without hesitation. What uh, the data has shown us, uh, what is more likely the reality, is that Lenin targeted a very small number of people and was able to carry out a military coup through those means. And the revolution only came later uh, once they were able to seize the power of the state and then they could liquidate their enemies and that sort of thing. That it was a very uh, limited uh, propagandistic victory where 
thanks to the outgoing regime, thanks to the monarchy, thanks to the provisional government that had been displaced in the February Revolution, the, what the Russians really wanted was just an end to Russia's participation in the war. That by embracing the horrible uh, destruction of World War I, the old regimes of Russia had essentially slit their own throats and invited a revolution. And so Lenin, who was smart enough to come in and see, oh, I'll just promise them peace, was able to accomplish uh, a lot through th those means. And all that was really necessary then was to identify one-tenth of the local military garrisons and convince them to help him seize control in St. Petersburg and Moscow later. So they won through superior... Uh, organization. They won through targeting just the right people. They won also through 20 years of sowing the seeds of intellectual, of an intellectual movement that they later were able to harness and use against a very small number of people who then came over to their side. This idea that in order to affect any sort of great change with intellectual movements and with political power requires you to win over 80 or 90 percent of the population or even a majority of the population simply has not been the case historically. It wasn't even the case in the United States really during the revolution where as in St. Petersburg in 1917 most people they just wanted the, the violence to end. They just wanted to be left alone. And fortunately, Americans in that case, who just wanted to be left alone, they, they ended up being better off. Russians, not so much. Uh, but by then, Russians had become so accustomed to various failed coups and palace coups that how were they supposed to know that this next coup, the one in 1917, was going to be a disaster for them? So history can sometimes be on your side. Uh, but we shouldn't confuse these accidents of history with telling us that, uh, that the Leninists were on the right side of history or that it was inevitable or that the, the flows of humanity were necessarily going to create a specific outcome. That's just not, that's just not how that works. And so the, there could have been, had there been a substantial bourgeois class present there, had there been people who actually understood something about liberalism, which the Russians did not and didn't care very much about, they probably would have been able to defeat this Leninist movement and prevail. But the intellectual movement did not exist there in favor of the good guys. And so the bad guys had a much easier time of winning. And we can see all those different places, the intellectuals, the, the military officers, the political organizers, the guys who would organize a, a protest here, the guys who could get through and talk to the people in the garrisons who they needed to talk to. They had all these connections in place. They knew who to talk to. And those are all different pieces that people need to, to know about. And we can learn a lot, I think, from, from the Leninists on that. And Rothbard understood that as well, as we see from some of his new left period back in the 1960s. But shall we move on to the actual mail yes. from uh, our, our listeners? Uh, this first one comes from Chris, Chris of Milwaukee. Uh, and some of these questions are from our Mises U audience. This one is not. Uh, he says, this is actually very long. I'll edit it down. Uh, but he says that, that he started out as a, a young adult socialist with a passion for enlightenment and ideals who followed the torch of liberalism to the Libertarian Party in particular and libertarianism in general. And so he goes in and talks about how he spent all these years trying to do that whole thing, that oh, like Libertarian Party activism thing. And he's now beginning to feel it's a waste of valuable resources, uh, of, of which he now has an ever-dwindling supply. Uh, he's probably older than me, so has even less energy. Uh, my question for you is this. Do you think it could be possible that now is the time to stop attempting to use the system's own tools against it and begin taking practical, loosely guided steps toward the gray economy or counter economy. So now he's, I get this, he then gets into kind of the techno-libertarian argu argument where he says, technological innovations like remote commerce and electronic currencies, et cetera, et cetera, have given us an extraordinary confluence of opportunities for managing our own financial and familiar affairs. And he, he then goes on to say that uh, basically now that we have these technological means, and, and he was disappointed after all these years of doing, uh, uh, doing activism. He's thinking of staying home on election day. 
Um, so should he do that? Man, this email, this note triggers me in like six different ways. There's so much in here, right, that where, where this fellow went wrong. The first was having a passion for enlightenment ideals. Um, the, the, the greatly confused, uh, the, the term, uh, this shows the propaganda value, right? The, the fact that they call it the Renaissance, um, as if it was a rebirth of something. This was deliberately chosen by a bunch of people who hated the Middle Ages. And so, oh, we need a rebirth because the Middle Ages was awful. Uh, and we'll also call it the Enlightenment because now we're enlightened, whereas before we were in the dark. And so we've never been able to shed these terms, which are obviously propagandistic terms. Although historians do now refer to the Renaissance not as the Renaissance, but as the early modern period. So there was that victory. Some progress. Um, yeah, we don't call it the Renaissance anymore because it wasn't. It wasn't a rebirth. Um, the Renaissance actually is more uh, characterized by despotism and a flight towards state power. Uh, the far better appreciation of, of liberty in the Middle Ages than in the Renaissance and Enlightenment. Uh, so there was that problem. Also, there's the issue of uh, techno-libertarianism, the idea that, oh, we have technology now, so we'll be able to uh, get rid of the state because we'll just take te technology out of their hands. We've been saying this for 25 years. Uh, and guess what? It didn't work out at all. We used to say back in like 2002, oh, the, you know, we have Amazon now. We don't, we can just buy whatever we need and we don't need the state to regulate anything. We can access all these goods. We can read whatever we want on the internet. And the state is just dwindling in terms of its influence over everyday life. Well, guess what? The state figured out ways to seize control of all of that stuff. Uh, the state uh, censors now more than ever. Uh, well, Arguably not. I think we, I take that sentence back. The state censored horribly in the 50s and 60s when there were only three TV uh, um, stations. But certainly things are far more censored now than they were 25 years ago when we were talking about how, oh, you know, well, we have total freedom now, thanks to the internet. And then finally, there's the issue of, should I stay home on election day? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, if you, if you want to, go ahead. I can guarantee you with mathematical certainty that your one vote will not change the outcome of the election. I do have an issue, I think, where if you spend all day long trying to convince everyone who has similar values to you to not vote, uh, that's probably not helping your cause. Because uh, basically, you're just ensuring that the worst people then uh, will get into to office. But I would say that really this, so many people, I get notes like this all the time, right? I spent all these years running candidates, going to uh, political caucuses, and the bad guys kept winning. Well, there's a couple things to consider. I think one is that the bad guys might have been winning faster and more if you hadn't been there to put up a few obstacles. There's that. As Lou Rockwell says, right, if it, weren't, if it weren't for people like Mises and Rothbard, you think there's a lot of socialism now? Just imagine how much it would be without the freedom movement of the last 50 years. It would be basically 100% of the population would be in favor of complete and total despotism. And so there's that. So there, some victories have been made. But this ideal idea of technological in innovation, I don't know about any of that. I have seen zero reason or evidence to think that. Turning toward gray or, or uh, black markets, well, the Soviet Union had huge amounts of gray and black markets. Didn't, none of it toppled the regime. It provided an outlet from the despotism, but it wasn't a threat to the regime. It was a good way to get a TV, but the, the regime, if anything, was working with the black markets because all the people running the state used the black market to get stuff that they wanted. And so there's just real no threat anywhere to the regime here. And I would agree to a certain extent that probably a lot of this political activism was just far too light. It just wasn't nearly uh, radical enough because a lot of these activists I know, they have faith that the system will somehow work in their favor, but it never actually does. It's okay to participate in the system's institutions as long as you know that it's all BS, that you shouldn't have faith in it, that you shouldn't regard it as something that's going to save us, that it's not something that you owe any loyalty to, that it's not something you should speak well of. There's no reason to not vote against the bad guys. There's no reason to not go to, uh, as we did back in 2008, we went to the Republican Party convention and we voted in favor of Ron Paul and we were a thorn in the side of the party at the time. But I never went to that thinking 
that when I left that convention, having been voted down and shouted down by all of the old pro-McCain horrible people, uh, I didn't think, oh, well, I thought we were going to win. And it turns out we didn't, so now I'm discouraged. I knew we were going to lose. But we did it anyway, first of all, because it was the right thing to do. Secondly, because a lot of people did learn how the system works by participating in that system. It also helped to demoralize the people who were in favor of McCain and all the 60-year-olds there who um, thought that uh, the Republican Party was wonderful and that uh, they, they had the right answers to everything. Well, we helped uh, uh, explain to them that they were wrong and that they were on the losing side and that they were horrible, despicable people. And, you know, they had to go home hearing that. So that brightened my day, um, just to tell them how despicable they were. And, you know, why not? Why not do those things? But if you fall into the idea that, yes, let's be part of it. Let's, let's participate. Let's have faith. Let's, uh, let's think that the system works. Uh, it doesn't. You should use the system as Lenin and his people would do, they'd use the system to their advantage. The abolitionists would use the system to their advantage. But they all knew that it was inherently corrupt and they were always willing to break away from it if necessary. And they certainly didn't speak well of it. So I think the attitude uh, is very, very important. What you do within the system uh, is, is one thing. But if you buy into the lie, if you think that it's going to work, uh, if you go in assuming that the good guys are going to win using these institutions, well, you're probably wrong. Uh, the real purpose of participating in the institutions should be to destroy them. And uh, that, that can be done from the inside, but also it just helps to just spread the word that the institutions are corrupt and ought to be destroyed while you're there. So while you're there, while you're talking to all the other people who are activists and everything, make sure they know that it's terrible and awful and that it's corrupt and that they should lose faith in it as well, and I think that's that's something very important that should happen. One positive thing, though, is I think I think focusing away from kind of political activism as an independent self and towards you know what are things individually within your own life, you know whether it's the you know the, the agorism sort of stuff, right? The gray markets, trying to you know economically isolate yourself as much as possible from the extension of the regime and things like that, right? Moving away from kind of broad political activism, particularly libertarian, capital L libertarian party stuff, to something that is more you know, what are the things that you can do on the margins within your own life individually? I think that is a step in the right direction. All right, well, let's move on to our next question. This one's from Zach. American conserv this one is a Mises U person. American conservatives often talk about America being a nation. And J.D. Vance recently referred to America as, quote, a people. It seems to me, however, that America isn't a nation, and there are numerous different peoples and cultures in the U.S. that are nations unto themselves. Can you offer a Rothbardian solution for American conservatives yearning for true nationhood? Uh, I think the real answer here is found in Mises uh, more than Rothbard. Uh, but let me first go back to the first part of it, is that, yes, I agree that the United States is not a nation in any sort of meaningful sense that we would describe a nation uh, just using the scholarship from the last hundred years on what is a nation, what is nationalism, uh, what forms a nation, and are Americans a people? Uh, I, you know, I've just uh, always... I have found that people who talk about the United States as a nation and as a people and do all this raw, raw national unity stuff, they're always in favor of the status quo. They're always in favor of preserving the state. They're always in favor of not really doing anything to change matters substantially. A lot of it's just based on, they seem mostly motivated by nostalgia or even worse, nostalgia for a reality that never actually existed. Uh, and that's, that's, of course, the case for the United States. Um, I don't know how you could know anything about 19th century America and think that America is uh, a people united in some sort of common cause or something like that. Um, just ask a Catholic in New York City in 1850. Uh, have you been welcomed with open arms? Are you now a member of the, these people? I mean, you just read the political comics about Catholics in the 19th century. I mean, the, these, there, there was no feeling that this, we were all one people and that these people were, were uh, among us. And then you had the additional problem of the fact that the United States was constantly pushing out westward, uh, peeling off pieces of other countries. 
So if you were a uh, Mexican-American in New Mexico in the 1880s, were you part of a nation with the rest of America? Were you part of a single people? Mm, I don't see how you can come to that conclusion. We can especially look at how the United States uh, behaved in these cases. The US Congress denied statehood to New Mexico for decades after they first applied because they weren't American enough. Because the New Mexicans, they were Catholics, they spoke Spanish, and we only let uh, you know, real Americans have statehood. And on top of that, of course, you had a bunch of uh, Anglos moving into places like South Texas and New Mexico and conniving with the local uh, federal judges to steal land from the people whose only crime had been they happened to be living in Mexico when the United States stole half of Mexico. So now they're on the wrong side of the border, and it took them decades to be accepted as members of this one people. So. Uh, I've never seen the time when this one people existed exactly. I suppose after World War II, they were able to propagandize the population enough uh, to convince people that they were all part of one thing. Uh, and so there were, of course, people who didn't believe that, but they were a pretty small minority at that point. But I think that was just a short period in American history where uh, people had been convinced that this was all just one thing and that they were all part of it. And a lot of that was uh, real propaganda also in the sense of there were still people out on the margins who were just, they had it really drilled into them. I remember talking to my mother about Catholic school in the 1950s. And she was Mexican from a Mexican family in East LA and she went to a Catholic school in the 50s. She said they spent so much time on all of this rah-rah government stuff she said they learned to, uh, every morning it was the Pledge of Allegiance, it was singing patriotic songs, it was marching from class to class while singing uh, pro-America stuff, because there was this real movement in the 50s among Catholics themselves who inflicted it on themselves to hammer themselves into good, obedient Americans. Uh, so they, of course, then washed down their own religion, watered down their own religion, so they could feel like they were part of this people which had never really accepted them. It succeeded. They were able to uh, abandon their own principles and join uh, the larger people of America, but I don't consider that particularly a victory. Um, but I do know that people like probably Vance does, uh, that people like Pat Buchanan, uh, who I like Pat for the most part, but he always he was huge always on this party line uh, that the 19, as an Irishman, that was, was always kind of ironic, always talking about how America used to be a united people and we all got along perfectly well until the 1990s. Um, it's a complete fantasy. And I, so I agree with, with Zach here on that issue. I mean, before I move on to the issue of what's the uh, solution, do you have anything you want to add on this topic? No, I think that that's, that's absolutely correct. And I, I think that's one of the aspects is that I think there's been a lot of overlap between um, sort of the European right and the American right. Um, obviously, issues like immigration, things like that, there's been a lot of, of crossover there. But you know, thinking about things in the, front, in the American context, just borrowing from a European lens, I think offers a lot of problems there. And so, you know, I think... Yeah, the, the, the British, the, the, the European political problem, right, is separation from Brussels, right? So it's trying to push back against um, kind of anti-nationalist consolidation of powers with the European project. The American experience, na na nationalism is a, is, a, is a force of centralization, um, you know, in, in the wonderful imperial city of D.C. over everything else. And so I, I think in touching on the, the response to it, the solution to it, um, you know, having greater identity by a state or your region versus a, that, that, that grand American narrative um, is, is definitely a step in the right direction. Well, in the fact that uh, it's hard to identify groups that to this day view themselves as truly separate from the mainstream is due to the great success of American propaganda and the ability to crush uh, dissident groups who don't quite fully buy into mainstream American 
ideas. I wrote a, a column a couple of months ago called America is a Colonial Empire and a Fabulously Successful One because the dissident groups in America have been so thoroughly pushed into the background and robbed of what made them distinct that we've completely forgotten they even existed. So now that they've been essentially destroyed, we can all say, oh, yes, America's one people. Yeah, I mean, well, if you, you, know, you kill off all the dissenters or you force them to go to uh, certain schools where they learn certain ideologies and all learn to speak English, um, like during World War I when he outlawed all the German-speaking schools because they weren't American enough, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, eventually, sure, I guess you could at least uh, claim that we're all one people, but uh, just be aware of what went into that. And I just want to bring it up because I'm all excited about it because uh, it's such a good book. Uh, there's a book uh, that I'm reviewing at the moment called Unpopular Sovereignty. And this is a book about the Mormons out in Utah. And it's such a fascinating topic because uh, the the regular Christians back in the eastern United States were so worked up about the Mormons having uh, plural marriage and polygamy and all that stuff, and the fact that they'd gone out to the middle of nowhere in order to escape uh, the rest of the country and mind their own business, uh, Americans were still so upset that the Mormons would go out there and do their own thing that they actually sent an army uh, in the 1850s to go and force them to live in accordance with the way that the U.S. Congress thought they should live. And that, and denied them for decades statehood until they changed their religious views to fit with what people back east wanted them to do. So uh, that's a perfect case of, America, of the United States sending out um, the army because they disagree with the values of another people. And these were white people, by the way, right? It's easy to find examples of them sending out an army to kill non-white people. But these were white people. They sent out an army, and they're like, hey, you know, we don't like the way you do marriage. And so change your laws, or we're never going to withdraw our troops. You're basically uh, occupied territory now. And the only way that the Mormons were able to get statehood was to change their religious doctrines and decide that they didn't need plural marriage anymore. And then they got statehood in 1890. So, yeah, there's your one people success story for you. Sure, if you send out armies and tell people to change their religion, it turns out that that works if you stick enough guns in their faces. Uh, so what, what is the solution to this? Well, Mises has the solution. And I'll talk about this in my next talk, the issue of self-determination. Mises believed in unlimited secession. He pointed out that if you have a real liberal system, then you don't have to worry about whether you're all one nation or not because you allow people to live as they want. However, he also recognized that that's unlikely because of just the realities of people being control freaks and wanting to take control of other people's lives. And so he thought, well, the only way to really deal with that is secession, everywhere and always. And he didn't have any limits on it. He thought your village wants to secede because they speak a different language. They get to do it. And that was, the, that was the answer he offered to there being a variety of different nations within a single political polity. And uh, I think it's, it's a very good idea and really the only one I think that is workable uh, in the medium or long term. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I think short of actual secession and political you know, uh, separation like is just is, is a sense of identity. And part of that comes from understanding history. It, 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 and it's, it's creating unique cultures and traditions and things like that, right? It's, it's a homogenization of like the holiday calendar and things like that, right? These are aspects the state does to control the culture and the narrative and things like that. It's like in the, you're, you're here in the Southeast, <laughs> college football and the traditions that come with college football are a way that connects generations, well, you know, multiple generations across across time. It, it, is, it is a clear moment in the, in the schedule, right? You know your Saturdays, you're not going to be driving down Magnolia here in Auburn and things like that. So libertarians, I think, you know, can, you know, they'll make fun of sports ball and you know, kind of bread and circuses and things like that. But I know that there's value, and often it's it's the, the, the minor cultural stuff. It's Things are not life and death, peace and war, right? Um, but it's the common experiences that connect people and, and you know, build those elements of history that creates narratives independent of the regime, independent of the state. Um, and so again, particularly having those you know, localized, regional sort of own, own stereo, uh, narratives are themselves another aspect, I think, to, to that, even short of achieving political secession um, right away. If you do not have that common sense of identity, the, the, the pathway to getting to any sort of political secession becomes that much more difficult. All right, well, this next one is from Mark. Uh, 
My question for your Q&A is, is there any realistic pragmatic hope for a national divorce, or will we just have to wait for a financial collapse, a la the Soviet Union? Uh, well, yes and yes. I mean, obviously, there's some realistic pragmatic hope for it because it happens a lot. Um, and, uh, right, it's a <laughs> but does it require a financial crisis of some kind? Yeah, usually. Um, and that's probably what you need. It's very hard to find a state that doesn't have a financial crisis and has any sort of significant radical change. I mean, that's the French Revolution came on the heels of major financial problems for the French regime. The Soviet Union certainly had similar issues as well. So yes, you need that, but you need to have laid the groundwork for your separatism and for your liberalism ahead of time in order to take advantage of any sort of financial crisis that arises. That's a problem that we at the Mises Institute, by the way, uh, this is known among the editorial staff as one of our goals as the next crisis, the next economic crisis comes is, boy, we need to really just be full time on this issue of explaining what causes the crisis. Because having a financial crisis isn't enough, right? The, what you're going to hear all the time is the next time unemployment skyrockets, the next time there's a financial crisis, what are you going to hear? Too much capitalism. You're going to hear not enough regulation. Boy, if only the hardcore libertarians hadn't been running everything for the last 50 years and having total laissez-faire, we wouldn't have had this financial crisis. They're going to say exactly that. So all we can do is say, hey, right, there is no laissez-faire, there's no freedom, and I can explain to you right now how financial crises happen, how recessions occur, and that's a big role for us uh, in the editorial part of the Mises Institute. We just have to explain over and over again where rising unemployment comes from, where economic crises come from, because if you don't lay that groundwork and you don't, you're somebody's not explaining that, then when your, your crisis does come, they're just going to decide that socialism would have fixed it. So you need to explain that because crisis isn't enough. So you can't assume that just having a financial crisis is going to get people wanting to secede. They might decide that, oh, the real answer was centralized despotism, that uh, there was too much freedom, too much disunity. Well, you, well we'll be hearing a lot from the uh, uh, one people crowd telling us that uh, all of our problems stem from too much disunity. We need to uh, bring back faith in government. And you could definitely get that out of a financial crisis instead of, of a general breakdown in uh, the overall power of the state. So yes, of course there could be uh, a realistic pragmatic hope. Uh, but what is your time frame? This, is, this brings us back to Chris's email uh, from earlier. He had, he had a, a comment in here where he talks about how Basically, the, uh, the curtain is coming down, or what does he say? He says, we're only one inauguration day uh, away from having the curtain closed completely and for good. Uh, well, that's one thing that triggers me, right? Uh, statements, words like forever, never, uh, in politics, these, these words, they're meaningless, right? Look at a map from 100 years ago. And all those countries believe they would last forever uh, that were on that map. And a lot of them don't exist anymore, and their borders are totally different now. Look at the, look at the map of, a Soviet, of the Soviet Union from 50 years ago. They all thought the Soviet Union would last another 1,000 years. Well, guess what? It didn't. Uh, the British imperialists in 1770 all thought that was going to last centuries. Guess what? It didn't. So you never know what's going to happen. And also, so what if your time frame is more than five years, more than 10 years, more than 50 years? Maybe it's 100 years. Maybe it's 500 years. This is what the commies were always good about, right? Ho Chi Minh is like, even if it takes 1,000 years, we're never going to stop and we're going to keep fighting and we're just going to keep doing it forever. What does a libertarian say? Oh, I did this activism thing for six months and it didn't work out, so I'm giving up. I mean, that seems to be the attitude I mostly encounter. Um, so yeah, Ho Chi Minh had the right idea. And, I mean, he had a much better, I mean, th these people had some staying power. They had some uh, existential, you know, whoomph behind them. But uh, unfortunately, this episode doesn't have any staying power because we are up against our time window. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say, uh, say the, uh, the time frame is a long time. I mean, what are you going to do? Just give up? You're going to lie down? You're just going to say, oh, I guess the good guys won. Um, I'll just move out and do nothing for... 
uh, than for the rest of my life. And I'll just consume, I'll just buy things that my corporate masters tell me to buy. I mean, I guess that's a, the decision you make. You just watch, watch a lot of TV. Or you could just keep, you know, fighting the good fight and saying the right things and doing your part as best you can. And just remember that stop comparing everything to what you think of as the good old days. Maybe you should compare things to like the year 50. Think of yourself as like a Christian in the year 50, right? Imagine what they would do. Hey guys, we're really losing. They, they, they crucified our leader and like 11 of his 12 closest followers were all tortured to death. Just give up guys, give up. We're never gonna win. And I mean, what was that? I mean, nobody thought that in that movement. They, uh, well, actually, many people did apostatize and give up, but fortunately, they, they weren't wimps, uh, and they didn't take uh, the, this point of view that I get from so many people who think that, well, you know, we're just one step away from losing forever. Just as there's no such thing as a truly lost cause forever, there's no such thing as a truly won cause either. Even if we have some success for 50 years, you didn't win forever. You have to keep it up forever. That fight's never, ever over. So enjoy uh, what success you might get, but I can tell you that for your kids and your grandkids, they're gonna have to fight their own version of that fight. Um, so we can never give up. And I got bad news, it's never gonna get easier. It's just gonna be the same problems over and over and over again. This is the human experience. Um, so for, I, I just hear so much disappointment, um, so, many, so many worries about how, when are, when are we gonna win? When are we gonna have victory? Uh, and my answer is, I don't know, it could take a very long time. So our responsibility is just to do the right thing as long as we can, uh, as much as we can. You have anything you want to finish up with though? No, there is no end to history, but there is an end to this episode. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining Radio Rothbard this week. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>